Gradient Factors A Pathway for Controlling Decompression Risk by Neil Pollock Decompression procedures used to be much easier to discuss. Not that long ago, divers around the world generally trusted a small number of dive tables to protect them. Conservatism was added by either staying away from the limits or computing limits using greater than actual depths or bottom times to create a cushion. Simple. We now have dive computers running an array of base algorithms. More challenging, many designers or manufacturers have modified the base algorithms, frequently providing no details about the modifications. Still, we often choose to trust the box and its creators, sometimes with near-religious fervor, if the internet hype is sufficiently compelling. Also simple. The problem with simple solutions is that they often come with critical limitations. We must remember that decompression algorithms are mathematical models. They are intended to predict the outcome of complex physiological processes. They almost certainly do not capture truth, but they don't actually need to. All they need to do is to produce a satisfactory outcome frequently enough to be acceptable. The problem comes when we believe these algorithms are smarter than they really are. Decompression stress is determined by inert gas uptake and elimination. The dive profile is clearly the chief driver of this, but other factors, primarily thermal status and exercise, can play an important role in altering the rates. Dive computers are great at tracking dive profiles, but current devices do not integrate the impact of thermal or exercise factors in a meaningful way. And yes, this is even true for those computers that measure water temperature and or heart rate. It will also continue to be true for the forthcoming computers that measure heart rate, respiratory values or one or two site skin temperatures. The addition of these components is critical in learning how to build future generation computers, but a tremendous amount of physiological data has to be collected and analyzed before we begin to understand how to meaningfully integrate such measures into decompression risk models. What we do know now is that decompression algorithms, at least this side of the Star Trek universe, do not guarantee decompression safety. They can work well for some divers and some exposures, but the fact remains that decompression sickness can develop in people who dive within the limits of decompression models. The actual risk results from a staggering complex interplay of the dive profile, the timing and the intensity of thermal and exercise states and a host of individual factors. For some, the hopefully modest level of risk associated with current decompression algorithms is acceptable. Others may need to add additional buffers, either to address differences in susceptibility or simply for added peace of mind. And this brings us to the conservative settings. Many dive computers offer some degree of user-selectable conservatism, which is important since what appears on a computer screen is often accepted as an article of faith. It can be easier to follow the computer display showing a more conservative profile than to remember to stay away from those limits shown with more liberal settings. The biggest challenge in any case is remembering that just because the computer says a profile is safe does not necessarily mean that it is. Manufacturers have implemented a variety of conservatism and protocols in dive computers. Some are less logical than others, but again, truth is less important than a good outcome. Some are less logical than others, but again, exact truth is less important than a good outcome. The difficulty comes in assessing the impact of the array of settings particularly if they are incompletely or poorly described by manufacturers or marketers. Fortunately, 
In our imperfect world, there is one computational method of conservatism that I find intuitively easy to both quantify and understand, and that is gradient factors. Developed by Eric Baker, the gradient factors allow divers to adjust exposure limits to become fractions of another limit. In other words, gradient factors are commonly used Developed by Eric Baker, gradient factors allow divers to adjust exposure limits to become fractions of another limit. This will be explained just now. Gradient factors are commonly used with the Biermann algorithm, which is a well-researched set of decompression procedures for which the underlying source code was openly released to the community. The open release allowed a lot of bright and inquisitive eyes to fully evaluate the algorithm and contribute corrections that were incorporated into subsequently revised versions. Now we do need a little more background to proceed from here. Gas uptake and elimination can be predicted using so-called exponential half times. To illustrate, a diver descends to a fixed depth and stays there and one half time in this situation is the time it takes for a tissue to take up inert gas equaling half of the difference between the inert gas contents found when an equilibrium state is reached relative to the surface pressure and the gas content the tissue would have when it's fully saturated at pressure of the current depth. The next half time eliminates half of the remaining difference and so on. Complete equilibration is achieved in about six half times. The complication is that body tissues take up and eliminate inert gas at differing rates. The fastest tissues are the lungs, which achieve equilibrium almost instantly because they are directly exposed to the breathing gas at whatever pressure it's breathed at. Blood is another extremely fast tissue, followed by the brain. The slowest tissues are those that are relatively poorly perfused, such as ligaments and cartilage, or those that are relatively poorly perfused and have a high capacity for inert gas, such as some fat tissues. Each half-time used in an algorithm is referred to as a so-called compartment. Any given compartment does not have to equate to an actual tissue, Rather, the intention is to use a collection of different half-time computations to estimate what happens throughout the body. Robert Workman coined the term maximum value, which became shortened to M-value. This was around the mid-1960s when he was conducting decompression research for the US Navy. Albert Bielman and other modelers also used that term. The M value describes the magnitude of supersaturation, in other words, the gas pressure greater than ambient pressure, that a given tissue can theoretically tolerate during ascent, before an orderly elimination of inert gas becomes replaced by a negative outcome. In other words, when the chances of developing bubbles and bubbles leading to symptoms would be the more likely outcome. M values can be predicted for a tissue compartment construct. Faster tissues have higher M values based on the expectation that they can tolerate higher degrees of supersaturation than slower ones can. In part because their fast clearance rate means that the high levels won't exist for very long. The computational power of dive computers is essential for estimating the status of multiple compartments in real time. Adjusting the exposure limits based on whatever compartment is deemed most critical at any point in the process becomes the controlling compartment. This is important since modern divers rarely follow uncomplicated square profiles. Instead, they frequently follow complex descent and ascent profiles relying on the dive computer to keep track of their decompression status. While M value is a useful concept, we know that bubbles can form and DCS can develop 
even in exposures within M value limits. This is where conservatism factors become important. Knowing the theoretical limit may not be safe and additional conservatism is desired to allow limits during decompression to be adjusted with the computer displaying the revised guidelines. This adjustment can be made with strategies that so-called fool the computer. For example, the amount of inert gas in the breathing supply can be set to be higher than it really is, if the user adjustable capabilities allow for this. Or nitrox can be breathed while using a computer set to air. Alternatively, the surface pressure could be set to lower than actual pressure, again to prompt more conservative computations. The problem with fooling about is that undesirable side effects can result. For example, if a diver is breathing more oxygen than the computer expects, it will not provide the warnings about excessive oxygen exposure that it would have if the correct oxygen levels were registered. A better alternative to fooling the decompression algorithm is to limit the severity of the exposure while fully informing the model. This brings us back to gradient factors. Gradient factors are defined by two values. The first number of the pair or gradient factor low represents the percentage of M value that establishes the first stop during ascent. In other words, that is as far as you may go for an initial decompression. The second number, or GF high, is the percentage of the M value that should not be exceeded at any point during surfacing. The dive computer effectively draws a straight line between the two which creates an ascent slope. Dive computers that incorporate gradient factors typically provide either a limited number of choices or allow fully adjustable ranges because many of these facts are much more readily understood when presented in a graphic way we refer you to the related article which you can get by following the link at the end of the podcast. Gradient factors to continue. Gradient factors were primarily developed for technical diving, but the concept translates directly to recreational diving, especially when using the gradient factor high value. The typical slow ascent rates common in modern diving means that the GF low is often not reached unless a low value favoring deep stops, perhaps less than 20, is selected. The GF high typically determines the greatest magnitude of decompression stress reached during the dive. Gradient factors are relevant to multi-level as well as square profile diving. Some divers will not appreciate the need to incorporate additional conservatism, particularly if they have not experienced decompression problems in the past. It remains important to remember though that subclinical insults in other words, undetected forms of decompression sickness could pose risk over time. Aging makes us all less than bulletproof and things that were possible with a younger physiology may not be the case as an individual's physiology ages. Extra conservatism can also be reassuring and for many divers spending extra time in the water is a pleasure rather than a penalty. Certainly most people will agree that developing decompression sickness is a penalty that is worse than delaying or shortening a dive, than delaying the ascent process or shortening the time at depth. Guaranteeing a safe outcome for all divers would almost certainly require an unacceptable degree of conservatism but tools such as gradient factors can provide middle ground. Divers who want to adjust their exposures for conservatism, who want to adjust their exposures, can do so easily.
Computers that allow setting changes during a dive provide even greater flexibility. Issues that may warrant adjustment include expending greater effort than expected at the bottom or a partial loss of gas supply. In the first example, the diver could reduce gradient factors high to add more buffer. Or, in the second example, they could increase it to prioritize the, surface, uh, the surfacing speed over decompression conservatism. Those who rely on dive computers that lack this flexibility must remember to build in and follow their own buffers, regardless of what the box displays. Learning about the available options is an important strategy in managing risk. The thoughtful and well-informed diver knows far more about conditions that may affect real-time risk during the dive than our current dive computers do, and probably far more than dive computers will for many years to come. It is important to use the available tools effectively for both planning and implementation of every dive. This will help ensure a good outcome that every diver expects.